Oh, here we go. Let's dip it even worse. Or this is all for kids. Ah, look at me, I'm unstoppable. So, uh, welcome everyone. I'm one of your hosts today. Um, you know, we've actually got a whole bunch of us here running the show. Um, but I'll start this off and, uh, and then I'll send you off to experts and smart people. Um, and we'll go from there. So, hi, my name's Eli. Um, the other great people here are Chad in the back, Andrew who's been sh schmoozing as you've come in, and of course we've got Tanya here, one of the other smart people today. I'll tell you all about that. So uh, we are here on unceded, on unceded Indigenous land. Um, props to our brothers and sisters who have welcomed us here. You're also at a Net Squared event. Who here is all brand spanking new, never been to one before? Oh, well hi there new friends. So uh, this is one of about 120 vulture run meetups scattered across the world with the real mission of let's throw nonprofits and techies together into a room and see what kind of magic happens. So each one of these events are free and usually take on some kind of issue or case study around how do nonprofits bring technology into their work. Next good, Squared Vancouver is the local chapter. Um, we've got about 3,000 meetups. I may be sponsored out at this point, but uh, talk to me. Maybe I'll create an opportunity for you. There are, of course, washrooms. If you just go down the main hallway to the right, you're gonna find some around there. And if that's busy, take a key out the door. Don't worry, Chad or I will be in the back and we'll help you out with that. The other thing is, we're in this shared co-working space, which means there are actually people still working and keeping their offices in all these back corners. So if we can sort of keep it to this zone, that'd be totally awesome. And then finally, we got internet. I'm gonna let you have this password up here for about five seconds, but you'll see those little honeycombs on the back walls that actually have the password. So if you need that wireless, like head over and like peer at it and we'll all be there for you. As I said, there's a whole bunch of groups. It's pretty exciting. I also told you about the great volunteers who make this thing happen. Basically, we don't legally exist. It's fabulous. Um, but, you know, so it's all run by volunteers. But there are some sponsors who make it happen. So, if you're a nonprofit, charity, church, or library, and you are paying all the money for your software, you should stop that because I want you to pay little or no money for your software. TechSoup Canada is your one-stop resource for that. They've got everything from the Adobe Creative Suite down to Google for nonprofits, Office 365, you know, everything you basically need to run a nonprofit, or at least a good percentage of it, it's there and it's 30% to 100% off, so it's the place to be. Look at all those great things. You want those great things. We're also sponsored by this place, The Hive. We have been here since day one when they opened. We're super grateful, and if you're looking for an office space because you don't like your colleagues, or maybe you're lonely working from home, this is the right kind of place. They have photocopiers, like a real office desk, you know, people to gossip with over lunch, so all the good parts of an office, but you kind of control it and can drop in as you want. There's also free date passes available, so uh, talk to me and I'll be happy to hook you up with that. We got IX payments. Who here, hands up, takes money in online, donations or some such of their organization. So you should talk to our friends at IX. They are based in Vancouver, which is great, because it means if it doesn't work, now you can walk into their office and give them some SAS, but luckily, it pretty much always works. IX is also amazing, because they are gonna cover the first round of booze after this event. So don't rush away at the end, because we're gonna take you out over to Darby's and uh, drinks are on us. We're also sponsored by One Day Website who make sure that our website isn't broken, which I'm super grateful for because I am bad at website stuff. Um, we're sponsored by Enten who holds a great conference and they help like, cover the cost of some of the snacks here today. And so if you're a nonprofit techie and are looking for your people, it's a membership based organization and they have a super fun conference that's gonna be in New Orleans, y'all. It's gonna be pretty fun. Um, and we have a brand spanking new sponsor as of today. It's the Vancouver Community Network. You may know them as the old people who 
put together the original Freenets that made internet access and email accessible back in the day. They've now reached out and they're actually starting to build out like applications for use across civil society. So their latest project is something called the Street Messaging System, which basically allows social workers and other people who work with homeless people in Vancouver to easily access the communities they work with and send out announcements because they've basically created these specialized SMS distribution lists because that is the one way you actually can reach people if they're not going to be checking their email on a regular basis because they may not have those facilities available. So uh, they'd love to talk with you about bringing in your services into their software. And we're on Twitter, so if you want to gossip with us, hashtag Net2Van is the place to go. And we are almost done, I swear. So, at the end of this, you guys are going to show off. You're doing interesting work. Maybe you're trying to hire someone. Maybe you are new in town and looking for an organization to get involved with. Maybe you just finished off a new project and you were super jazzed about it and you just want to tell people how cool it is. You have 60 seconds to do that. And so cue it all up in your brains and we're going to do that at the end of the event. And then speaking of things that we're kind of jazzed about, we have loads of events upcoming through the rest of the year. April is going to be your accounting month. So we're going to start off with an event which is just all about like, what do you as a nonprofit need to know about accounting, bookkeeping, and QuickBooks? And we'll start all that off with a bit like of a lecture presentation style thing which introduces best practices. And then two days later for a daytime session, we're going to get all super hands on. So now you're going to bring out your laptop and we're going to sit you down with an accountant who's going to say, here's how you're supposed to do it so that you aren't sad all the time and your numbers actually make sense. Um, and then in May, Chad in the back is going to do the show and tell. Chad, what's it going to be all about? So the show and tell is a chance for you, maybe like you have some fancy magic that you do um, with technology to kind of further mission, but it's not like a whole one hour presentation that's intimidating. So anyone that gets a lot of this to show things that they can do. So it's kind of a crowdsource sort of session. We've done a number of these over the years. Sometimes people are like, this is fancy new CRM I'm using. Here's this donation platform. Here's a social media magic. It's a chance for you to show something and It's going to be pretty great and super relaxed and it's where you learn all the new tools and tricks. So that's why I first discovered Trello. That's where I first discovered the text ex expansion tools. It's where I first discovered how to do screen recordings so I can create really easy videos to support people um, as opposed to writing out long documents and hating my life. So uh, super helpful and it's fast moving with these five minute presentations. And then speaking of things we're excited about, we took last year off for a big fancy almost annual conference, but we're back. So this year we're going to go to the Roundhouse, which means 225 people because we keep on selling out the event. And it's going to be the place where you want to bring your boss because we're going to go talk deep about digital strategy and organizational topics. So we're going to talk about how does your organization hire remote friendly staff because all your good employees want to move off to the island and like if you want to keep them around, how do you, your organization make that happen? Or we're going to talk about where do you put the digital strategy team in your organization? Who do they report to? And like what are some models that work so you don't again spend a lot of money on new staff that turns into recriminations and sadness. So we're going to talk a lot about that, plus there'll be some sexy campaigning stuff, online fundraising, all the good stuff, plus three food trucks, two coffee carts. We are going to make sure you are fed, happy, and ready to learn. So now it's time for me to get out of the way. We're going to talk about how delivering webinars can benefit your mission. We are just super lucky that actually two of the core organizing team members are both really experienced and have spent literally thousands of hours delivering webinars for their organizations. So they're going to blow your mind, give you a model for how you can succeed, and, uh, and I am going to go drink some water in the back here. So uh, we've got Tanya, and uh, you know she is the professional development coordinator with the engineers and geoscientists of BC, and I love that word geoscientist, it's actually, it sounds super legit. And then Chad has got this made up title. Um, he is the director of development. He's now like a what? Innovation? Director of innovation, yeah. 
Yeah, directive innovation, you don't know what that means. Chad is starting to, yeah. yeah, he's starting to think and he's starting to figure it out. He's over at the Neil Squire Society, which actually does this really interesting work building um, mobility aids um, and interface devices for, again, people with limited mobility. He'll talk all about that work too. Now, ladies and gentlemen, let's set up with Tanya, who's amazing.
increasing social media traffic. Uh, this one, it's an online seminar that you, you know, market online. So clearly, social media is a benefit out of that. You'll increase followers and participants, especially if you're able to post your uh, videos on YouTube. Um, training volunteers and ambassadors. So if you have a lot of volunteers or people who are spread out across BC, across Canada, across the world that you need to facilitate or train all at one time or interact with on a regular basis and really engage, uh, webinars can be a great way to do that. And then, of course, access to a <coughs> worldwide audience, which is a really great thing to be able to download your webinar report and look at, oh, I had somebody from New Zealand who attended my webinar, and somebody from Norway, and somebody from Ireland. Like, it's always really cool to see that kind of reach. Now, before I get into <laughs> planning webinars, there are challenges and barriers to hosting webinars. I think the biggest one is staff time and resources because it does take a lot of time to plan and organize webinars, particularly sourcing speakers and sourcing content. So those can be very challenging aspects to it. Also financially it can be challenging, especially if you are wanting more, like a more, more robust system to run your webinars on. So some of the tips and the techniques that I'm gonna kind of go through today will address some of those challenges and hopefully make them a little bit smoother and a little easier so it seems more manageable. The most important thing of this entire session is strategy. It's really, really, really important that before you start a webinar series, before you dive in, because it does take staff resources and money, that you really think about what is your mission? What are your goals? What kinds of outcomes do you want from your webinar? Um, are you looking for member engagement? Are you looking to increase donations? Are you looking to educate? And there's, yeah, again, there's so many ways you can use webinars that really defining how you want to use webinars will make a world of difference um, as you're planning out a webinar process. So some of the organizations I've seen utilize webinars very effectively have one of these or all of these um, as part of their mandate. So if your organization looks to educate people, whether that's the broad public or more like a smaller membership, if you do a lot of outreach, public outreach, webinars can be great ways to have live interaction with the people that you're reaching out to. Volunteer engagement, as I stated previously, super great for that. And then if you are particularly targeting an audience who has accessibility issues or where that is key. Um, so my previous employment before this one, we mostly targeted people with chronic pain and disability issues uh, was our main population, which I'm gonna talk about. Uh, and so that was where we really utilized the accessibility issue because most of our people uh, that would attend or wanted to attend and get this information couldn't leave their house or didn't often leave their house, couldn't sit through a three hour course. Um, so the use, having the ability to sit in their home for an hour and learn all about this cool research that's happening about chronic pain treatment was super, super helpful and enlightening for them. So I used to work for the Work Wellness and Disability Prevention Institute. Um, I was the program manager. When we first started thinking about webinars nine years ago, I proposed it as an idea, as a possibility. We thought, well, maybe, let's give it a try. I don't recommend doing it that way. <laughs> it, it ended up working out great, but it took a really long time. <laughs> So I recommend, as I said, put some strategy and thought into in advance of buying the software and then just going, eh, let's see how this goes. Um, so we knew that our main mandates were education and accessibility. 
we wanted to take research and put it in the hands of people who needed it, both people with pain and the people helping people with pain. And we knew those people needed to access it wherever they were. Webinars were perfect. Um, our goals, uh, we wanted to boost the credibility of our organization. We were tiny, well, they still are tiny. Um, and we really wanted to get out our name as, you can come to us, we only provide research-based information about your health and about your you know, workplace wellness and you can trust us. And, and then we wanted to expand our mailing list and our membership. And webinars helped us do all of those things way more than I would have thought possible. Um, we started out with just one webinar a month on chronic pain topic. And we thought, okay, this is great. This is just right. We got about six months in, and my boss was like, let's do two a month. And I was like, okay, we could probably make that work. Two a month, all right. So we did that for another year. And then he was like, you know, I really see a gap in workplace wellness and people with pain and disability being at work and keeping them at work. Let's do a session on that. So we started, we kept doing our two month on chronic pain. And then we did one a month on disability issues. And so we had two topical streams going. And then my boss is like, hey, this is going really great. <laughs> <laughs> How about we add one more of each? And I was like, cool, okay, are you gonna hire me somebody else to help me do this? And he was like, yes. So we got a part-time person. That person helped with a lot of sourcing speakers, uh, managing topics, doing some of that research piece so that I could focus on marketing and um, facilitating all the events and that sort of thing. So in the end, for about a year, I was running five webinars a month. But what we saw from that was uh, our email list grew from 50 people to over 5,000 in just about three and some change years. Our membership went from, grew from my boss's parents <laughs> to about 200 people, uh, which was huge for us because we didn't have any public front at all when we started. And we did eventually become more of a credible source that people came to specifically for health-related um, information, and they came because of the webinars. Um, so that was, that's one way that webinars can be super effective. Um, the second case study I have is where I currently work, and this one is very different because I now work for an organization that has probably about 75 staff, and we have a huge marketing and communications department, so I don't even manage most of that. I just send out an email every now and then. Um, and so my role is a lot less, but we still do a lot more of the strategizing of when to use webinars. And they've been over the last two years working on increasing those because most of our sessions happen in person. But in-person events are very expensive. You have to get a hotel, you have to get food, you have to pay a speaker, you have full day events. So we've been looking at webinars as a more affordable option uh, for both us and our members to help increase their engagement because we were getting a lot of feedback that our courses were too expensive, that they were too long, that people couldn't commit to that, take the time off. And so webinars have become for us a way to really hit up um, the member engagement piece and to let them know we're listening to you, here's some more affordable options, here's options where you can do it from your desk, you don't have to come into a place, uh, that sort of thing. So it's been Quite effective. It's a little bit still trial and error with here, but it's been it's been going really well. So, say you've gotten through all of this and you think, okay, we know where we're going. We've strategized our mission, how we want to use webinars, choosing a platform. This can be a whole session in and of itself. However, I have included in the resources and. My PowerPoint will be available afterwards for you to download so you can access all of this. But I've included in the resources two different lists that are webinar platform comparison lists, and they will be way more informative than me going through all of these platforms. 
Um, but what I will say is, as with anything else, the more money you put into it, the more functionality you get out of this. And coming from you having a really strong strategy with how you know you want to use webinars will help you make this decision on what's going to be the best one. Um, the ones on the left hand there are all the more affordable options. And the bottom one, ReadyTalk, is actually available through TechSoup. Uh, I looked into it, the rate is super affordable, but it's only, the one they offer is 25 people. So if you wanted to start small, maybe with volunteers or something like that to get a taste of what it's like, you can do it for a very affordable price through TechSoup. Um, and then the other ones, I think are a little more expensive, but not, not super expensive. If you go to the list on the right, those are your more top level, mainstream, you gotta put more money into it, softwares. Um, the main difference is, the GoToWebinar, Adobe Connect, and WebEx provide more uh, robust ro reporting. They have more uh, registration options. There's more options for the surveys. Really, there's just more of the options of things you can control. Um, and so if you're an organization where there's a strict, like, we want everything to look and be a certain way, and we want to have control over everything, you're gonna have to pay for that. Because <laughs> the cheaper ones, you don't get as much control. But that being said, they do tend to be a little more reliable. They usually have really good support. Uh, and if you're wanting to do a lot of audience interaction, not just with the speaker, but with each other, so a little more course-like than webinar-like, uh, Adobe Connect is the one that will do that. It does it very well. Most of my experiences with GoToWebinar, because we mostly do a speaker who just has a presentation that they give to a live audience, so pretty straightforward. Um, so that's most of that, and then I would recommend checking out the resources list if you want more robust, like reading all of the functionalities that all of them can do and all of the price lines. All right, so diving into the practical goods. <laughs> um, so these next steps are more things for as you're planning a webinar that's coming up and then uh, facilitating that webinar and then or marketing that webinar and then facilitating it. So it's, I'm just kind of going to kind of go through some of the key tips and strategies that I found to be super effective and helpful in each of those steps. Um, and then I am going to go to the drinks afterwards. So if you have more specific questions or want to talk about strategies or whatever, I'm happy to chat at that as well. Uh, okay, um, the first thing you're going to want to think about is kind of the frequency and formatting of your webinar. Um, so how often do you want to do it? Do you want to do your webinar once a month, once every two months, uh, biannually? There's a lot of different options and again it'll really depend on what your strategy is and what you want to accomplish. I highly recommend once a month as a good steady place to start. Uh, the trick with that is it is, can be hard to really have the speakers and the content to keep that going, uh, but I'm gonna talk about some ways to make that easier. Um, deciding on a format, do you wanna do a topical set of webinars? Like, Do you wanna have a whole stream like I did at my previous work? It's all on ground of paint, and that's all you really do webinars on. Or you could do like a three webinar session on XYZ talk, how to save the whales, or how to recycle your cans, I don't know, whatever it is. And um, so thinking about those ways that you can utilize webinars, because they kind of have different effects. I have found that having at least a set of three that's on a particular topic can really be a good way because it keeps people coming back. They know what you're gonna offer, it's very consistent. So it's like, oh, I know, the second Tuesday of every month at 11 a.m. is a webinar with so-and-so, and they're going to talk about this, and then they're going to talk about this, and then they're going to talk about this. It provides structure for people to come back to. Um, and then there's recruiting speakers. So this is a very challenging part about webinars, or can be. Um, what I have found is 
If you're a large organization and you have a lot of staff, volunteers, board members that can speak, that's awesome and great, and you should do that. That's not always the case. Um, so I highly recommend coaching speakers. Um, find the conferences, because it's webinars, your speakers can be from anywhere. So you don't have to be location restricted unless your mandate is location restricted. So if your mandate is we only use people from BC because we want BC experts, then you would restrict yourself. But outside of that, you could have a speaker from Denmark, you can have a speaker from the States. There's no real restriction on it. Um, so I recommend finding the conferences that are similar to what you do and just go through the list. Oh, this guy gave a one hour presentation on exactly this topic that would be great for my company. Contact him or her and say, you know, you already gave this one hour web presentation. Would you like to do it as a webinar for our company? You know, because they already have it packaged, it's incentive for them as a marketing tool or if they're a researcher to get their information out. Um, they have incentive and it's easy because they've already done it. Um, the other piece to consider with speakers is depending on who you're recruiting, um, some of them like getting money for talking, and there's multiple ways to manage that. You can have an internal policy where you don't pay more than a $300 honorarium for a speaker, and then what that means is it just, you can just, if they say, I'd like $800 to do this talk, you can say, I'm sorry, our internal policy is no more than 300 honorarium. And then if they say, I can't do that, then you say, okay, we'll find somebody else. Um, or you can focus on doing them for free, in which case you want to approach professionals who are going to get just as much benefit out of doing the webinar as you are. So it's either a marketing tool for them, or they're pitching to your audience, or something where they're getting something back for it. Um, and then you'll also find the speakers who are just like, I really like to talk about this, I'll happily do it for free, which is also really great. Um, so those are just a, a few things I've found in recruiting speakers that can be more helpful, more effective. Um, and then the best advice I could give is give yourself a lot of breathing room. Plan out at least two to three webinars in advance of when you want to actually start providing them. I would even recommend four or five. The more space you give yourself, the more likely your webinar series, series is, is to continue. So say you get yourself four speakers, four dates, four topics, it's all lined up, and then once your webinar series starts, you can at that time already start thinking five, six, seven in advance, and you're way likely to keep that momentum going and continue to have programming that's consistent and provides value for the people that you're trying to target. Um, marketing your webinars. Uh, there's the real basic, use your own communication channels. Pretty straightforward, email, social media, all the things that you market, all of your other great things that you're doing, utilize all of that. Um, I recommend pursuing marketing opportunities with organizations, associations, or companies that are similar to what you do. Reach out to them and say, hey, I've got this cool webinar that's coming up. Would you mind tossing it in your email? Would you your marketing email? Would you mind posting it on social media? Would you mind doing X, Y, Z? Most associations are like, cool, that's awesome. Yeah, I'd be happy to do that. Could you do that for us? And you say, yeah, sure. I'm happy to you know deliver your stuff. And it's all a nice community building for associations, but you're also reaching a whole other audience that wasn't yours, which is great. And then the final piece is. Not a lot of people think about it, but you can pursue accreditation options. So if you're offering a one hour webinar on budgeting, you can pitch that to the Project Managers Association, to the uh, CPA, the Certified uh, Accounting Professional, CAP, or any of the other ones where they're their professional members are going to get a benefit of a one hour of professional development from your course. So the way we used to use it is we did mostly health related research based webinars. So I would every month email the Massage Therapist Association, 
the Physiotherapy Association, uh, we did the Social Workers Association, like all these associations, and when I'd say, here's our webinars we have upcoming, and they would post all of them on their websites and in their emails. And then you get regular repeat attendees who are like, I know every month I can come here and I can get an hour of professional development hours that goes towards my professional accreditation, doing whatever I do for a profession. It can be super powerful. I'm included in the resources a list of professional associations, um, a link to a list. And I recommend just perusing that and seeing what professionals have associations and what might fit with the content you're wanting to deliver, because it's a really easy way to just shoot off one email to like seven associations, and then they distribute it to their own members, and their members have incentive to attend. Um, and then always direct whatever links you're sending out to your own website. We found that building our email list was most effective because I would send out the email to another association saying, here's this link to this webinar we're hosting. And they'd say, great, I'll send it to my 300 people. Say half of those people, 150 said, I'm gonna go check out that link to that webinar. That looks pretty cool. You got 150 people who are on your website. Say a third of those are like, I wanna register to attend that. That's awesome. And then they go onto your form on your registration site. They say, here's my name, here's my email, here's any other information you're asking for, and check that box that says, I want more information on webinars. And that gives you 50 new people that you get to add your email marketing list instantly. And that can happen for all the associations. It's really great. My favorite part after a webinar was downloading all of our attendees and then cross-checking which ones were not on our list and then being like, ooh, I just got 75 new people on my email list. Ooh, ooh. <laughs> um, because that email list always translates into better option opportunities for membership, donations, all the call to actions that you're going to be asking for. Um, during your webinar, always assume your technology is not going to work or will fail you in some manner. It sounds doom and gloom, but it is so true. <laughs> Technology is amazing and fantastic and also glitchy. So there's things you can do to set it up, schedule a practice one run. I like to do one a week in advance with my speaker. Everybody gets on. We test all the things. Um, and then make sure you start 30 minutes early, get on with your speaker. Again, test all the things, because sometimes it worked in the practice session and it does not work in work on the day of. Um, and then always have a copy of your presentation, especially if your presenter is not with you, uh, like sitting next to you. I had one time, everything worked great in the practice run. I contact him, uh, we're waiting, waiting for the half an hour before. He doesn't get on, he doesn't get on, I'm like, oh crap. I get a phone call from him and he's like, um, the internet is down in my office. And I'm like, cool, luckily, I had the presentation. I pulled it up on my screen. I ran the presentation. He phoned in, and he did the whole presentation over the phone while I moved the slides. So it's all still possible, but you gotta know that that is gonna be a possibility and be prepared in advance. Um, and then after your webinar, uh, always distribute an exit survey. You can capture lots of cool information from the people who attend. What did they like? What did they not like? Do they have recommendations for speakers or topics? Um, it's just a great way to, they feel like they've been heard because they got to you know, expound about how great it was or tell you how terrible it was. Either way, they feel like they got all of that stuff off their chest and now they're connected to you in this cool way because you listen to them. It's really great. Same with following up with attendees. I like to send an email afterwards that just says, thanks for coming. We really enjoyed having you with us. Here's some handouts around the presentation. Here's the next webinars that we're hosting, or here's recording links to recordings of past webinars you might like, or so on and so forth. Um, and then post, if you have the permission of your speaker and your organization does this, uh, post and distribute online. It's a great way to build your social media um, traffic, and it's great for SEO. If you put all your keywords and tag yourself a billion times and do all that, you know, great digital marketing stuff, it can be really good for your SEO as well. 
Um, and that's all. That's what I got. Yeah. <laughs> um, it was a lot of information. I do have these uh, resources on here, uh, so you'll get them when you get the uh, presentation. And so there's some links to tips, a lot of stuff I talked about. Um, there's webinar software comparisons, there's the professional associations list, and then just some websites where you can get usually free web-based web training for people who work in nonprofits. So they're not necessarily about webinars, but they're webinars you can attend usually for free. So, yeah. Um, does anybody want to questions now? Do we want to bring chat up first? Does anybody have any strong feelings on the topic? Mm -hmm. uh. <laughs> well, uh, I have questions. Yeah. Yeah, so, uh, so I was actually, so it sounds like your recordings, you're posting up publicly as opposed to gating those behind. Yeah. Did you find that the live experience is so so unique or, or is the only way to get the credits and therefore it's not a conflict to take the recordings and make those available? Yeah, so what we were doing was you could only get the credits for attending live because with the recording postings, we can't track who watches them because we were posting them on YouTube. The other option is if you're using like GoToWebinar or one of the other bigger platforms, they often have a way you can upload the recording on their site and the people have to re-sign in and watch it again and you can track those. So you could offer like confirm accreditation hours for those people. And I am happy to talk about the specifics of accreditation and for people. For the most part, it's not very complicated. The most you have to do is some extra steps because you do need to provide people with proof that they attended. Um, but that's usually just like a Excel spreadsheet and a Word document that you lead it all into. Or sometimes, for a lot of places, just their confirmation email that they attended is enough. So you don't even have to um, do much more than that. So it kind of depends on the place. Can we use the Skype for business to do the Use Skype? Skype for business. Oh, Skyping for business. You know, I don't know. So your difference with Skyping for business, I would bet, is going to be a capacity piece. You're only going to have a certain number of people that can join on that, probably. I'm not totally sure. Um, I think it's geared more towards business meetings. So you're looking at more like having like maybe 15 to 20, 25 people online. Whereas the webinar softwares are, are made so that you could do 50, 100, 250, 500, um, just depending on how much you pay, <laughs> again. And, um, and they're more geared towards having your attendees not talk, but mostly listen, and then they can type in questions. So it's a little bit of a different format uh, than what most of like the Skype for Business or um, like even go to meeting, go to webinar has a meeting software that's only 25 people. And everybody can talk, everybody can share their webcam. So the webinars are a little more closed and controlled in that sense. Because if you have 150 people, you don't want them all able to talk, and you don't want to see them all. <laughs> yeah, in the back. Just, just a comment on, on Skype for business. I think the first 100 people sort of dial in visually, so they can dial in from the software. After 100 people have to phone in. Oh, okay, so yeah. I know two people on the phone number, but when you're using the actual software, you can't. Yeah. Interesting. I didn't know that. I, I actually have not, yeah, I haven't really heard about Skype for Business. So it is, it, it's possible. It would also depend on how reliable the software is for that kind of thing to hold those kinds of numbers. I know Skype on the not business level is not always super reliable or great connection, so that would be something to consider. I don't know. I haven't actually used Skype for Business, so. One of the issues we've faced is we've got a lot of folks in rural communities mm -hmm. that have, I mean, I don't know if they still have dial-up, but let's assume that it's not much better than dial-up. Yeah. And it can often be really challenging. They might have glitches, etc. And I'm wondering if you have any tips, thoughts, ways to around that so that they can still participate but not get bogged down by the glitching. That can be challenging. I see Chad raising his hand. Is that for an answer? Yeah, I don't know if it's universal, but some of the web platforms do have like a, 
audio being a jerk or internet slow, like dialing some numbers, so it's kind of like the audio is more like a conference call sort of piece. Yeah. The latest webinar hotness that seems to be all the rage these days of whether online is Zoom. Uh, and that is about much. I have my things, my internet, my office. It's not so great with my other people or the So when I have that, I usually just make yeah, that's all the phone line. and still do the screen share and see your kind of pixelated head. Um, yeah. Yeah. But, but the audio is more so, which I find is sometimes the most important part of being here as well. I agree with that. The calling in is a really good option. The other option is a lot of these have um, phone apps, and the apps are fantastic. Like, or for a um, tablet, and so those are going to run off of your, uh, can run off of your phone data instead of off of that. So if you don't, if you don't have a lot of phone data, don't recommend people do that. <laughs> but, or if you're on Wi-Fi, that can be an option that might be better. Also, I always recommend people with really bad internet connections try plugging in physically instead of using Wi-Fi. That's always more reliable than Wi-Fi, but you might still have problems if it's really rural. I would recommend phoning it is really the best option. Yeah. Suggestion is it's a really large geographic area. I don't know, but if it's, if it's not a huge geographic area, you can always partner with your library to mm -hmm. make it a in person event as well. Mm -hmm. And then you can really have that live internet plus an opportunity to discuss a topic after. So mm -hmm. you can add value. Yeah. Cool. Thank you. Slightly related question about like the Q and A period and best practices around. I mean, we've all had like full Q and A period. So like, what are like how much time do you find is good to allocate to it? How do you structure it so that it's actually beneficial for? Oh. That's a very good question. <laughs> um, I tend to do fifteen minutes. Um, most of the webinars that I've run, I structure as an hour with forty-five minutes of presentation, fifteen if not. Uh, some of the bigger ones we do at my current job are more like two hours, sometimes two and a half hours. And those ones you would allot a little more time for questions, or you would have two different sections for question and answer, um, depending on how the speaker wants to do it. But the structuring of Q&A is very challenging because you as the moderator have to decide which questions get asked and which ones in what order, and you're likely not going to get to them all. So I usually ask the speaker if he's willing to answer some after, so that if there's more difficult questions that I either don't know if it's appropriate to ask or they're more personal to that person, I'll just keep a tab of those and send them to the speaker after and have them send me back responses by email, and then I distribute that to the attendees. So that can be an option. Um, I think it's a really tricky one. I think, I think usually it's just a matter I, I actually, I don't have a really solid answer for that one because it is really challenging. Yeah, so I use the opposite problem, which is I get crickets. Mm. Um, so you'll see what I just did today is like, I asked the first question and then everyone had a thousand questions. So whenever I'm doing any kind of webinar, I always task one person to say like, your job is to ask the first question. <laughs> don't care what it's gonna be. That like your job, you pre-agree to ask the question. <laughs> and similarly, one thing I actually love about webinars and like live events is people type in their questions, which means then you have one other person whose job is just to say like, oh, look into these questions, webinar person. I as the host will select this and summarize the question for you, which also just prevents sometimes the craziness of any of us who've never been to like, you know, a conference and someone stands up and manifests themselves. <laughs> Another piece playing on that is I never let the speaker, unless they're really competent with a webinar software, I never let them read the questions, have access to the questions, I manage the questions. And mostly because um, speakers do have a tendency to just be like, oh, here's this one thing, and then they fix on it, and they just run. And it's very hard to pull them back. Um, and that does very much depend on your speaker. I've had a couple of really savvy speakers that do webinars all the time. So they're like, yes, I want access to that. I want to feed that stuff in as I'm going. But they have to be pretty like efficient with webinars. So I usually, I'm, a, I'm very controlling with them. <laughs> I'm like, no, no, that's mine. Yeah. I was just going to say, I do the same thing. Um, so we have two laptops that we're running. We often do in-person webinars. So we have somebody who's got the speaker laptop so they can run the show and then we've got the a support person who's managing the questions as they come in keeping a running tally etc yeah and that way 
all that they can mess up is the slides and you've got everything else going. Yeah. That's, no, that's, that's good good recommendation. Well, that the hard way. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. Yeah. I don't know if there's a generic model for the pricing of the platforms. Um, is it usually by, by participant, by frequency? Like, like <coughs> how, is there a one, one standardized kind of pricing model across all platforms? Or? They mostly do it by participants. Number of participants is usually how it's structured. There might be a few that are different, but I don't know that I've seen one that does it by like number of webinars. And most of them are a monthly fee, or it's cheaper if you do the year. Like you know, you can do the by month, but then um, if you do a full year, you get like twenty five bucks off per month or whatever their structures. But almost all of them are by participant. It's all based. Yeah. Yeah. Nonprofit discounts or them? Always ask about a nonprofit discount. Yeah. Go to webinar when I was using them at my old job, I uh, did give a nonprofit discount. It did not mean it was cheap by any means, but always ask for the nonprofit discount. Because there are some of those smaller ones might be willing to give it to you for free or at a very cheap rate. But you have to ask. Yeah. I think that you've done so many um can you figure out the time amount of time you need time to maximize Hmm, that's a great question. I would do no less than a month. Um, I have found three months to be great, but you can't always do that with that kind of lead time. So at least a month and a half, I would recommend, from the point where you've set up the webinar to give yourself plenty of time to market it, uh, would be my recommendation. But I mean, sometimes you work in crime time time crunches <laughs> and uh, and when that's the case then of course you have to push harder but I find that about a month and a half is a good minimum three months is fantastic and that does also depend on your marketing channels uh, so like my current job are we have a marketing email that goes out every two weeks but we have so many sessions that your session might not get into that until two weeks before in which case you have to like the whoever the coordinator is has to be more proactive at doing targeted emailings or you know, contacting other associations or doing some of those other marketing channels because it's not going to get out in the main blast until too close to the event. So just kind of kind of depends. Yeah. yeah. Do you ever encounter conflicts between topics that you would like to present on or you think is appropriate for your audience versus, say, Topics that you can ask for, but perhaps are not appropriate or kind of controversial. So how do you resolve that? Yeah, um, we have had some of that. When I was working in the chronic pain sector, we got asked all the time for webinars on cannabis and pot use, um, which was controversial and um, political and all of the things. It took us a long time before we actually broached the topic, and we waited until we found someone who was a very highly respected researcher who knew how to talk about it in an appropriate way. I would say if you have a topic that somebody, people have requested, you gotta find the right speaker that's gonna approach it in a way that your organization is comfortable with. Um, because if you just have you know, some guy or even like a guy who you think he knows what he's talking about, but then he gets up and he starts talking about things that you don't actually, um, you know, believe in as an organization, or that's problematic or political, or then that can be challenging. I would say really screen your speaker really well for that topic if you decide to pursue it. Um, otherwise, it's fine if people ask for a webinar and you don't give it to them. That's also totally legitimate. It's your organization. You guys get to decide what you put there and so if people are like banging down your doors for it then at that point you might consider finding seeing if you can find a speaker who can approach it in a way that you're comfortable with but otherwise I would just not if you're not comfortable doing it because that's fine as well. You mentioned screening your speaker to a standardized set of interview questions for example that you do with every speaker? Um we didn't at my old job because we were small enough that we were able to do enough of the research and really it just meant did my boss approve and my boss would look through their research stuff and say yeah they're good and usually my current job 
that we like it if they have some uh, evidence of them speaking in public <coughs> so we can know they're a good speaker. Uh, we also request that they provide, especially if they're um, like a, someone who speaks for a living, we ask them to provide references of other places that they've spoken. And the other, those are probably the two big things. Uh, you can also have a set of questions that you ask about them, like how many times have you spoken on this topic, or you know, if it is a delicate topic, ask them more pointed questions about how they would handle this topic, or something like that. But for the most part, we've relied mostly on recommendations, like having them either seeing them speak or having uh, references. Cool. I think we'll probably have some time to do a bit more Q&A at the end, and of course it's going to be the pub. Um, but yeah, thank you so much. That's super amazing. Like, there's a real depth of experience there. Thank you. <laughs> Speaking of depth of experience and I think literally thousand plus hours delivering webinars, we've also got Chad Lehman, who uh, has got a little bit to share as well today. Yeah, so while Tony did all the hard work of like strategy and planning and stuff, mine's just a little bit more of a case study of uh, what I did at my organization as we kind of gone to webinars. This is a little bit dated, you can tell my slides are four by three, but like, you know, and whole like era up here. Um, so I work in a nonprofit called the Neil Squire Society, and we use technology, uh, knowledge and passion to empower people with disabilities. And one of our main core programs is an employment program for people with disabilities. And it's nationally funded, which is different than a lot of employment programs. It's usually provincial mandate things. Um, but to be part of a national program, you have to have a national reach and reach different areas. So we have offices uh, in different parts of Canada. And uh, shortly after I came on, I started doing some work with the Penticton Indian Band in the Okanagan. And they were interested in opening sort of a, like a satellite Neil Squire Center. And they were literally building that uh, log uh, house there. Um, with some uh, government uh, youth skilled initiatives, like teach youth different trade skills. They built this house, and then inside that they offered social services. So I actually went up and lived on the band uh, for a month and helped them kind of finish the building, try not to be perceived as the white guy from Vancouver that knows everything, like went through a lot of like, the ceremonial stuff with them. I helped sand the logs, put together, and kind of help uh, resource the disability center. But the idea being that the things that we were doing in our employment program in Burnaby uh, helped deliver those onto the band land. Uh, specifically at that time around different assistive technology and computer technology. This was like mid 2000s, so you know, your Facebook and YouTubes were almost born, but not quite yet. And for many of the people in the community I was working with, like this is a, you know, we're gonna sign you up for your first email account. We're gonna learn what this fancy search engine thing is all about. Um, so in doing this work, we have in the Maritimes an office in Fredericton and a smaller office in Moncton. They're much bigger now, back then it was very small. And that was funded as one office that a couple staff here and a couple staff there. And they ran the program in both those locations by doing what they called distance learning. And the person that started that was head of distance learning circa 1980s um, for the province. So distance learning for them was a polycom that people sat around a table and lots of binders. Lots and lots of binders. And again, mid-2000s, telecom isn't like what it is now. There's no Skype app or WhatsApp or chat sort of piece. So they were paying, uh, I think, well, 12 cents per minute, per site. So it was just like, when it was just two of them, they're just, you know, it's one phone call, it's local, it's not a big deal. But when you start bringing in Chad's Burnaby classroom, and my Ticton classroom, and then my Vernon classroom, um, all of a sudden it's like, okay, so that's like 12 cents a minute, it's a two hour class, times five sites, and we do that four days a week, and that price got like crazy, really high and big. So that's where I started, like, you know, there's these new things called webinars that they're being used at the university. How can we use this sort of software to deliver it at a much cheaper cost? We eventually tackled the binders of paper problem, but before we start every 12 week program, we literally have, like, you know, chapter one, chapter two, chapter three, and I would pick up a binder and have a rolling chair and just go around the desk and put it all in, build these boxes and ship it out. So we moved to more of a learning sort of management system over time. So the idea that I was sort of pitching was, we have this 12-week program that we say is a national program, which really only happens four or five classes, but all these 
different regions where we were in BC, Saskatchewan, Ontario, and then throughout the Maritimes had these different partners that they were trying to support. So like, how can we create some sort of systematic way where we can reach these people consistently? Um, we had a lot of resources, we had a lot of materials, different from Tanya. Um, we had like a staff body with these knowledge, and actually, in some areas, like we had, you know, one of the first people that ever had assistive technology certification ever in Canada in the Maritimes. Like, let's unlock his brain and share that with other people in different areas. We had some real great wellness experts in BC. How can we show that to our staff in Ontario who do not have that on their team? So it really kind of allowed us to sort of share our knowledge, not only to our participants, but within our staff and actually kind of gave them all a platform. They all felt very special when they did a webinar. But at first they were terrified. I mean, I was like the young guy just out of university um, and many of them were, you know, on the later stages of their career at this point, right? They were afraid of the computer. So a lot of the webinars started with, with the Chad show where it was like, I did every webinar. It was every morning because it's like, those Eastern people, if I did it at nine in the morning, it's one in the afternoon for them. So it was like, four to five days a week for two to three hours for 12 weeks, take the week off and then kind of start it over again. Um, over time, people kind of saw me doing like, you know, it doesn't look that hard. Chad barely knows what he's doing at all. <laughs> I think I could probably do this. And so it came to more, a little bit the moral user had where they would talk, I would be there beside them, you know, kind of hold their hand a little bit, make sure the technical weird stuff was sorted out. But it got to a point where I was having 50 people on at a time and it was less of like this or more, like I am talking at you, more sort of like an engaged learning, like let me show you something, now you're going to do it. And so I was using some secondary software which let me log into the different people's machines. So very quickly, every time I was around this class, I could figure like, okay, this is my student that's gonna have the most problem in Penticton, this person's gonna have the most problem in Vernon. So I would have all these monitors on my desk and I could see how Jack was doing and Bernita was doing. And so I could watch them like as I'm doing it, I'm like, okay, Jack, that's Yahoo Games, I think you need Yahoo Mail. So let me just help kind of like <laughs> click the right thing for you there and keep them on track. But it kind of built up a business of trust. What I would do, I couldn't always go back east all the time, but to the Okanagan, very early in the program, like week one, week two, I go up there, so I didn't seem like this weird Wizard of Oz guy behind the curtains. I could, you know, talk to them, they could meet, see me face to face. We'd take apart a computer in front of them to kind of demystify the whole thing. Just to build that sort of trust so it wasn't a big deal to like, it's a similar sort of thing. It's like, you know, a lot of these people, it's their first sort of email account or search engine, and this guy that sees my screen all the time while on it kind of freaked them out, right? So just kind of build that rapport and relationship with people. So what I was eventually able to sort of convince the powers of be at that time is like, you know, we have this BC region, the Saskatchewan region, et cetera, et cetera. Let's have like the virtual region whose focus is really to serve those people that can't get into our offices at all. Um, and we ran into those issues around rural sort of things and phone calls. We had people that were going to the local community center or library to access services. Um, but it became like a real core piece that like these people really reached people that were hard to reach. Um, which at that time with that current government, that current funding was a big thing. It was sort of like really reach the people that aren't being touched. So we started this employment program that we still do some of this uh, online, probably less webinar stuff now in this particular program. So we got pilot funding, um, well this is just a, sort of at, at its peak of, you know, that was in one class where I had different, again, it's a government of Canada funded program, so I literally had people from coast to coast, and had someone up on the Yukon that were kind of following along and working, and it wasn't like a, a one-off, these are people like, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, you have this session with Chad, or eventually other people, and then usually it's kind of like we introduce our topic in the morning, do some stuff together, and then it's more sort of self-directed, usually follow-up pieces on that, and then be emailing back and forth. The part that you talked about um, that was really important that, you know, a lot of people don't think about, it's like it's all this bill for the webinar and get it, and you know, you deliver the webinar and you're done, but you're not done. Actually, that's just, you know, that's the middle part of your journey. It's all the follow-up sort of pieces. For me, when I was wearing that hat, the role was like, you know, people be emailing their work from the morning or pieces that will be marking it and giving them feedback and stuff. But the this prep for your webinar and prep and doing the lesson and then like praying that it doesn't technically fail on you in the middle of it. Uh, but it's the follow-up stuff that I find is sometimes more valuable. People will forgive a you know a, a weird web connection, but that, that ongoing engagement for me and communication being accessible was uh, more important. We took it the, the 
what kind of started at Neil Square, kind of started the organization, was basically having um, young engineers um, helping teach people disabilities computer access in the early 80s, so making custom accommodations. And we run this in a couple of our offices where, you know, someone with disability can come in, they work with a volunteer staff member, learn their computer goals and what their needs were. But we got, you know, we kind of built up this webinar infrastructure. We had, you know, the car paid for, so to speak. It's like, what other sort of things can we drive with it? So we moved to, we still have, like, you can come into our offices and learn computer skills one-on-one -on -one for free. But not everyone's on a SkyTrain route, handy dart sort of piece, or lives in the metro Vancouver area to reach. So we started um, a virtual version of our computer tutoring program, where basically we set on, let's say, Ashley's desktop, you know, a little link, Ashley's class. She can click it. It's her very own webinar room where the volunteer or staff member can meet her in. And then, um, you know, Ashley, can I see your desktop? She says yes. And then she works on her computer, on her learning goals, on things that she wants. And for us, this actually grew the program significantly. We, there was a number of people that wanted to volunteer, but Monday to Friday, 9 to 5, they got a real life and real job. But on Wednesday nights, when the X Factor's on, they don't really want to watch it with their significant other. They're happy to spend an hour and a half to tutor somebody. So we started serving the hundreds of people in these sort of hours where our office was closed in the evenings and on the weekends. It really kind of tapped into a skill sort of volunteer base that we weren't getting before. Before we are kind of getting students that were voluntold to have to they do some hours with me. Um, it really allowed us to get some like professionals in IT and start going to deeper things. We had to be able to teach some people some web design stuff and that was a goal. Where it was in the classroom was traditionally very sort of fundamental sort of pieces. The part that was really good for me, you can see how technically literate I was at the time when I did the, uh, this presentation, like I couldn't do a flow chart at all. Nothing's changed. Um, but for us, the big part of when we were starting setting up people that were going to be participants in, especially this one-on-one -on -one sort of model, was we'd have an intake, and that was like traditional phone, like, you know, understanding all the computer stuff, and we talk to you in a very normal way, or the phone, your barriers, what you want to learn, it's very self-directed. And then we'd have a session beforehand that was just technical setup, where we'd try to make sure the computer was like, not like bogged down with viruses or malware or bulletware. Um, made sure that they could get to that, you know, Ashley's classroom link on their desktop, set up some technical backdoors, made sure they had a headset and knew how to like unmute it and turn it on and off. So much of your time is spent in technical troubleshooting. Um, and we sometimes do an assistive technology assessment if somebody needed it. I had a budget, sometimes it's wanes, it depends on areas. Um, but you know, if someone had difficulty in accessing the computer due to their disability, try to figure that piece out. So that when I had them paired with a volunteer and do tutoring, you know, I had a fundamental, like I knew what operating system they had, version of the office, what their goals were, and what worked, and how to unmute their microphone um, remotely. Usually when we kind of started tutoring, the first session or two, like our former staff members would kind of be there, make sure people get connected, follow up, kind of, you know, like Eli can fry the pump, make sure things are going well. Um, and then we kind of, after session two or three, we'd fade out. Even in session one, we'd once again get connected. It's like, okay, I'm gonna go cook dinner now. Uh, you gotta do your thing, and then you know, I kind of like, headset off a little bit, make sure they're doing their, doing all right. Um, and at the end of every session, um, like when they finished their sort of four months of tutoring, we had this sort of formal skill assessment survey. But at the end of every session, we were able to force a pop up that would come up. So like they close the webinar program, pop up come up, and it was a super short survey. It was like, what's your name? How do things go today? You know, five to one. Any technical problem occur? Um, anything we should know about. We also, we used a, um, a more expensive platform, not as expensive as what we were paying for, it was those giant teleconference calls are going on all the time. Um, but it allowed us to force record all sessions, so someone didn't have to go in and remember turn on recording. Everything was recorded. For us, that was beneficial for two big reasons. One, um, student learned something, they could go back and watch it again and again. And like, how did I, like, get those pictures into like a music DVD thing that we burnt, they could watch that part of the lesson forever. Um, and the other thing was, if there was any dispute, like the volunteer did something awful on my computer or whatever, we could actually go back and sort of monitor that. So that sort of recording piece had great value for the participants, kind of to, you know, if something's tricky, they can watch it a few times, and for us, for just a sort of quality of service sort of piece. Similar thing with the uh, volunteers, kind of do a traditional sort of intake. A lot of them we did have the opportunity to meet face-to-face, -face. some I've never met face-to-face -face at all. 
just had to stalk them on Facebook and LinkedIn to figure out who they were. Um, so we would do uh, an orientation session, kind of go over like here, you know, there's some policy stuff, here's some resources that we have, here's some like best practice that we have in teaching it. Um, we do a separate tech setup with each individual one. The orientation, we usually kind of onboard a group of volunteers once a month. The tech setup, we kind of just did one to one to make sure their things were working. That was usually easier because they have signed up to volunteer to teach computer skills. Usually they have this sort of technical foundation stuff figured out. Same thing, kind of loop them through on tutoring and then those sort of exit surveys over time. And a lot of the volunteers that we've had kind of come into this, especially in this sort of like remote volunteer model, you know, they might be like, all right, I'm going to take the summer off, but I'll, you know, we back in fall sort of thing. And we've had volunteers that have done this with us for years and years. So we've kind of got a longer standard volunteer base. Where there's a couple of people that come in our classroom on a fairly regular basis. Well, those usually kind of cycle through. So we've kind of had a longer volunteer engagement model that kind of use webinars as a tutoring platform. So yeah, this is a little dated, but um, just give you an idea of sort of the, so the Moodle was sort of the binder piece when it kind of got started up earlier on. Uh, certainly this has changed since then, but um, yeah, we have a number of webinar rooms. With the platform I use, I could create infinite rooms. So I can make each client have a personal room, not to worry about someone coming else to someone's classroom where things getting shared, which is valuable for us. And uh, yeah, a number of live sessions and the ability to kind of serve a number of attendees through this sort of platform. Like, there's no way at our offices we get 8,000 people through the door. <laughs> it's just like it wouldn't happen, right? And not in the room. So that's sort of what I wanted to share, though I made a couple of notes just when I was Tanya was speaking about things that. Um, I just have thoughts I want to kind of add in. I talked about platform stuff and Zoom seems to be very popular. Who's used Zoom for a webinar platform? Give us like the, the, the two minute, like is it expensive, like from the mint sort of end? Um, I can't speak to the pricing since I don't pay for it. Um, it is in the TechSoup America catalog, but not yet in Canada. I hope to change that. Zoom is like every other webinar platform. It just tends to have been slightly more reliable. And by reliability, I mean, I get less complaints by people trying to connect into the conversation. It's not, so it's not like, is the connection stronger? But people complain to me less that I couldn't get into the conversation. And I don't know why that is, but that's the reality I experienced. So that's why I like it. I can speak a little bit to that. We had a pre fancy presentation. Hi. Uh, am I really that quiet that I need a microphone? Hard to believe I know. Um, <laughs> you haven't been drinking yet. Yeah. <laughs> Chad, you know me too well. Um, I was going to say, we had a really fancy presentation from the folks at Zoom, and they, <coughs> one of the things they talked about was the technology. <coughs> Zoom is actually really good for the rural communities because they have this fancy technology that adapts to whatever that person's connection is, and it will automatically decrease the, uh, I guess it's the DPI on the video to make sure that the, the, the no um, no audio, thank you, no audio is missing. So that's kind of what we looked at and we were like, oh, maybe this would be really beneficial. But because we use a different platform, we haven't made that move and we don't know if we will because um, we really do like the platform we're using. But other than that, if somebody's got a smaller audience than we have, it might be a good option, if, especially with rural communities. Yeah, I'm not sure those are separate things just have been named or not, but it's zoom.us is the every meeting request where someone doesn't want to look on the phone with me, but do the sort of online sort of piece lately um, that I've been kind of pulled into that we're starting to look at personally. Um, yeah, that's kind of it for what I want to The only other thing is like I kind of restart the program piece, but um, we did start to use it on like some special events like International Day People with Disabilities. We had this, you know. Our executive director talks to the work on brain computer research, so we've used it. It's on the sort of email brand awareness generating piece. And then started doing more volunteer sort of focus sessions too, to have more young interns that were coming in to work with us. Like, let me train them on how to use some base technology. So, um, yeah, you, you may start with one piece and then they'll like, oh, there's a special thing and kind of have the sort of special pieces you can plug in with that. Otherwise, I think that is it. Why not? That puts us on schedule. There we go. <laughs> <laughs>
probably talk to more uh, over here because that's uh, much more conversational that way. But I think we have like one minute updates now. Is that the plan? Let's do it. Why not? Want to host All right. it? So I will, I will model this for you. So this is your chance to look fancy for one minute. Eli will get his giant cane and pull you off stage if you go too long. Um, so something that I have coming up at Neil Squire is I have this new initiative called Makers Making Change. We have engineers, hackers, um, engineering students to help me make assistive technologies for people with disabilities. On March 17th, which I know is St. Patrick's Day, I'm feeling a little too old to go out and drink green beer all night, um, but there's this event called World Create Day where hackers are getting together in their communities around the world and building different things. So I'm doing an assistive technology focused one. We're doing um, accessible video game controllers. So someone that may not be able to use your standard Wemo or PlayStation joystick, we're gonna make a bunch of different um, different style joysticks that meet the functional needs of people. And where would you find out more about this? Where would you find out more about I just signed it up today. Try <laughs> typing Hackaday Chad Lehman. I don't know. Let's see. I'm a filthy liar. <laughs> I'll tweet it at you. Um, I'm doing it at the Vancouver Hackspace. That might be the, the vanhack.ca. So we'll be there from noon. We're going to be building a bunch of these. As of 6 o'clock, there'll be some speakers with a bunch of different stuff, and then uh, we drink beer there. So, and be there you go, you've run out of time. Perfect. Anyone else have something fancy to share? It's coming to spring. Are there galas coming for people? <laughs> some people have done their galas. Anyone looking for a volunteer? Come on up. Come on up. Yeah. I used to probably do a bit of an introduction, tell people about yourself. Hey folks, my name's Sam, uh, Sam Middlewood from London, not from Vancouver, you may be able to tell. Uh, I've arrived fairly recently and um, kind of spent most of the past few weeks getting involved in meetup groups and networking and just getting out there, kind of building my own network. And I'm actually starting something myself here called Be Inspired Vancouver. Um, which is reflective of my own journey. 18 months ago I found I hated my job, I hated my house, I hated my car, my life. Chaos! Um, decided to move to Vancouver and escape, really. But during that time, I um, spent a lot of time finding things that inspired me. And so Be Inspired Vancouver is all about connecting storytellers with an audience who want to be inspired, but also a storyteller who can share actions. So whether that's to have unbreakable confidence, whether that's how to get, peel yourself away from social media um, for maybe more than 10 minutes a day. It's, uh, it'll be quite an amazing thing. So Be Inspired Vancouver, first event is going to be at the end of April. If you want to know more, um, Sam Middlewood is my name, um, and I'm on LinkedIn. It's probably the best way of uh, getting hold of me. Unfortunately, there is no BeInspiredVancouver.com as yet. Um, the platform for which it's going to run is, is pending, but <coughs> Sam Middlewood on LinkedIn. Yeah, yeah, top one, adventure. See, it's so easy. Yeah, yeah. Awesome. All right. Thanks very much. Thank you. You're welcome. Cheers. Who else has got amazing things on the go? Come on up, come on up. So this is not fair because I stutter. So, but this one minute is not going to be enough. Well, <laughs> no, no, no. no. Okay. Well, we're flexible. Keep yes, going. Yes, I'm going to be very quick. So 20 years ago, I'm software guy. I develop software, I'm software architect. Uh, 20 years ago, I got a client uh, who said that nonprofits uh, need software to count stuff. And I did that software, and that software was nominated uh, to be the best software for nonprofits in North America in the year 2000. Uh, my up uh, my competition was uh, UN, NASA, Microsoft, FBI, and similar companies, and my software is up to date in Washington, DC, in Washington, DC, in Smithsonian. Uh, and then I did other projects. Uh, today I have my own company. I'm doing something very similar. Uh, 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 one more time. It's uh, 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 it is uh, going to be uh, more modern, and uh, non-profits are going to be uh, targeted. If anyone is interested, I have business cards. Thank you. Great, thank you.
Awesome. Anyone else have something fans down to go? Looking for a volunteer? Looking for a new job? Have some hot gossip to share? <laughs> well then, let me not keep this going to the very bitter end. Um, all you need to know is, uh, is that we're going to go out now for a little bit of a social times. And it's going to look a little bit like this. So uh, here's the deal. We are going to disappear in about five minutes. Your Pied Pipers today are going to be... Oh no, put up your hand. All right, these are these, these nice ladies with their hands up, up in the air. Follow them, they're gonna leave here in about five minutes and they're gonna go take you down to Darby's if you're not quite sure what that is. Basically, go outside, go to the right, it's a block and a half, don't like stay on this side of the street, it'll work out beautifully. Um, three of us are gonna stay behind just to do a quick power clean and we'll meet you in about 20 minutes. Um, as you head out, if you want to just sort of take your dishes and drop them over on the counter in the kitchen up top here. Um, otherwise, thank you just so much for coming up and joining us today. We're going to be back again in April with two events. So any of the, your colleagues who are trying to figure out like, well, what do I do about this crazy budget thing that's making me sad? we got events for them. We'd love to take you guys through that as we come towards end of fiscal years and all that madness. Otherwise, on behalf of all of my co-organizers, Thanks for joining us today. Thank you very much.